Hi, I'm Stephanie Trunzo, SVP and GM of Oracle Health. And I'm here to welcome you to Oracle Live, the future of healthcare. It is a sincere privilege for me to host this event. I'm gonna be joined by a wonderful lineup of speakers. Larry Ellison, Chairman and Chief Technology Officer. Tony Blair, Executive Chairman of Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Mike Cecilia, Executive Vice President of Industries. Dr. Jim Hildreth, President of Meharry Medical College, amongst many others. I suspect many members of our audience see this event as six months in the making from our announcing our intent to acquire Cerner in December last year. As you're gonna hear today, Oracle has actually been working with the healthcare industry for decades. Some of the proudest achievements have been the most recent with our deep commitment to improved public outcomes throughout the pandemic. These efforts have starkly illuminated the challenges in today's model, siloed data, inability to provide scalable global insights, and an orientation to the system that has not been designed to keep people at the center. Combining our existing Oracle Health portfolio with our Cerner acquisition, we will accelerate our ability to improve health, reduce costs, and enhance the experience for all humans. It is my pleasure to introduce Larry Ellison to share the vision for a new health management system. Over to you, Larry. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, uh, together, Cerner and Oracle have all the technology required to build a revolutionary new health management information system in the cloud. That system will deliver much better information to healthcare professionals. Better information will fundamentally transform healthcare. Better information is the key to transforming healthcare. Better information will allow doctors to deliver better patient outcomes. Better information will allow public health officials to develop much better public health policy and better information will fundamentally lower health work, healthcare costs overall. Today's health management systems from Cerner, from Epic, from Allscript, from really everybody are hospital centric, not patient centric. What I mean by that is every hospital or hospital system buys their own and operates their own information system. There are thousands of hospitals in the United States. If you live in LA, UCLA, Cedar sinai USC, there are lots of them all over the United States. Each hospital system has their own, their own health management system. Each hospital system has their own patient electronic health record database. There are thousands of them throughout the United States. Your patient records, your patient records uh, when you go to UCLA, your patient records are in the UCLA database. When you go to Cedar sinai uh, your patient records and have, have an exam, those records, those results end up in the Cedar sinai electronic health record database. You go to USC, it's in a USC database. In other words, your data, your electronic health data is scattered across a dozen or two dozen separate, separate databases one for every provider you've ever visited. This patient data fragmentation, EHR fragmentation, causes tremendous problems. Two of them extremely serious. So let's say you live in LA and, and sometimes you go to UCLA and sometimes you go to USC and, and your health records are scattered across you know, a half a dozen hospitals in the LA area. And then suddenly you take a trip uh, to attend a wedding uh, in Cleveland. And on the way to the wedding, you get in a traffic accident and you're rushed to one of the best hospitals in the world, the Cleveland Clinic. Well, they rush you into the emergency room and they, they can't find any of your health records. They cannot get access. They don't know what your blood type is. They don't know what your allergies are. 
<clears throat> they don't know if you have a metallic stent in your heart. They don't know anything about you. They don't know in, in terms of your health records. Uh, you know, those, that, that data is at UCLA and that data is at USC and that data is in Cedar sinai databases in Los Angeles. There's no easy way for Cleveland Clinic to get that information. Without that information, doctors can't provide the best healthcare in the case of the emergency. Ironically, Cleveland Clinic can get access to all your financial data by, by just looking at uh, your, uh, the credit card database, looking at your credit card and, and they can you know they get all your financial records because all your financial records are stored in a single unified credit card authorization database. There's no similar unified database for electronic health records. All that data today is fragmented, again, in thousands of databases across the United States and tens of thousands around the world. While your health records are in a dozen or two dozen separate databases, the health records for the American, uh, the American people is in thousands of databases all over the country. If you're a public health official and you want to find out how many people were hospitalized uh, with COVID-19 in the last 24 hours, you can't get at that data. That data is literally in thousands of separate databases. You'd have to go into every single database at Stanford, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, at MD Anderson, uh, and count how many people were hospitalized at that hospital, and then add them all up. There's no way to do that. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to solve this problem by putting a, a unified national uh, health records database on top of all of these thousands of separate hospital databases. So we're building a system that where the health records, all, all uh, American citizens' health records, not only exist uh, at, at the hospital level, but they also are in a unified national health records database. That national database solves the data, uh, the data uh, electronic health record fragmentation problem. Now, the same example, you're in Cleveland Clinic. Uh, you arrive in Cleveland Clinic in an emergency and Cleveland Clinic can instantaneously access all of your electronic health records. They can get it immediately. Uh, and they get the very latest version of your, uh, of your health records because it's, uh, the way the system works is we continuously upload electronic health records from the hospital databases into this national database. So that data is up to the second accurate. So they get all the information they need about you, what, what your blood type is, what your allergies are, what drugs you're currently taking, do you have a stent in your heart? They get all of that information instantaneously. And with that information, they can deliver to you much better care uh, and, uh, and, it, and much better outcome. And that information will deliver much better patient outcomes. Doctors are now armed with the latest information so they can make better decisions. Note that uh, to give uh, doctors access to your health records, the, oh, there's only one person in the world who can give doctors access to, uh, to your health records, and that's you. You hold the key to all of your health records in the national EHR database. Nobody can say that, well, all the health records are stored in the national EHR database. They're all anonymized. Nobody knows who they belong to until you supply the key. So there's absolute data privacy. So we solve these two, uh, these two problems at the same time. We want to give doctors all the information they need about your, uh, your health status so they can provide the best possible care, but we don't want to compromise data security and data privacy. And we've done that with this system. The other, the other use of the national EHR database, which I, I'll say is anonymized, it doesn't have, it doesn't have your name or any identifier that identifies that says, you were hospitalized with COVID-19. Uh, you know, it, it knows someone was hospitalized with COVID-19 and they can count all the people uh, hospitalized with COVID-19, but they can't identify them. The public health officials can count the people, but not name the people. 
we ensure that we're not compromising data privacy. At the same time, we want to give the public health officials and your doctors the best possible, most up-to-date information without compromising privacy. So the public health officials can see how many people were hospitalized with COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. They can see uh, exactly the number of hospital be beds are available in New York City at this minute. And maybe most important of all, uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, a team from the University of Oxford and Oracle developed a system uh, that gene sequences and classifies all the variants of COVID-19. And, uh, and, and that system called GPAS, the GPAS system, was the system that identified uh, Omicron and Delta and all of these different variants that showed up during the pandemic. And it identified those variants very early. Uh, so the public health officials, again, could see not only how many people were hospitalized, how many beds were available, but they would see these new variants of the virus very early. And that was extremely important because everyone was worried that existing therapeutics might not work with the new variant of the virus, that the existing vaccines might not be as effective uh, with the new variants of the virus. And if that was the case, we needed to modify the, uh, uh, the vaccines and we needed to do it quickly. So the sooner we discovered uh, there was a new variant, the more quickly we, we could respond and, and improve the therapeutics and improve the vaccines. The idea of the GPAS system uh, is, uh, is to uh, identify not only new variants of COVID-19, but um, a new variant of influenza, which can be extremely dangerous. Any novel, any unseen virus, we wanted to identify it very quickly, very early on uh, to, make to make sure that uh, we can respond very early on. Another important new component of the uh, health management system is this thing called the patient engagement system. What the patient engagement system does is it, it op opens a two-way channel. It's a smartphone application. Uh, it opens a two-way channel between patients and their healthcare providers. So it's very easy for you to, to talk to your doctor and your, and your doctors to talk to you. This patient engagement system was first used uh, during the pandemic, was built by Oracle and first used during the pandemic by the US government to allow vaccinate, people who were vaccinated to share their vaccination experience with the government. We're in the middle of a pandemic, so we built the system very quickly. It was, uh, it was built in, in um, you know, less than two months. Uh, it, it runs in the Oracle Cloud on the Oracle Autonomous Database. It was written in a, in a language called Apex, runs on your phone. Uh, and again, this allows patients who opt in, patients who want to voluntarily share the side effects of uh, their vaccination experience. Do you have injection site soreness? Do you feel fatigued the next day? Do you have a low grade fever? You could share whatever, uh, whatever information you wanted to share about your vaccination experience. Uh, the VSAFE would also remind you of the date you're due for your next shot, your second shot uh, of the vaccine. The most interesting thing to come out of VSAFE was that um, it collected the information that showed it was safe to vaccinate pregnant women. When the clinical trial for the vaccines, uh, you know, whether it's the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, all of the different vaccines, when the first clinical trials were run, pregnant women were not included in the clinical trial. In other words, they weren't allowed to volunteer for the clinical trial. Therefore, when the vaccine was approved, pregnant women were not approved for taking the vaccine. However, VSAFE, uh, people who were reporting their vaccine experience via VSAFE, uh, over 130,000 of them re uh, reported that they didn't know it at the time when they took the vaccine, but they, they were pregnant when they got the vaccine. And it turns out they did not report uh, a significant number of adverse events. In other words, taking the vaccine if you're pregnant, taking the vaccine if you're not pregnant, you got the same positive outcome in both cases. We collected that data on 130,000 women in the United States. 
that uh, that was eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and the regulators in the U.S. decided that was that information was good enough to say that even though pregnant women were not involved in the clinical trial, the formal clinical trial, all the data about the women who were pregnant that were vaccinated uh, and the fact that there were no adverse events allowed the U.S. regulators to say, all right, uh, pregnant women can now safely take uh, the, uh, these vaccines and they're approved for pregnant women. We are continuing to enhance the patient engagement system. Now we're extending the patient engagement system uh, to collect information uh, from wearables and home diagnostic devices. Let's, let's say uh, you just had a heart valve replaced and you, you're, you're out of, the, by the way, you, that, that happens and depending on how it's done, you can be out of the hospital the next day, believe it or not. And, but the doctors want to continue monitoring you. Um, and they want, to, they want to look at your EKG every day and your blood pressure every day. Well, now they can do that when you're at home. Uh, and, and the patient engagement system allows you, you collect the information, it's stored in the patient engagement system, and then sent every 24 hours to your docs. If there's a problem, they can respond back to you and alter your medication. So that is the link. That is the two-way channel that allows, allows you to communicate your vitals, uh, EKG and blood pressure to your docs, them to communicate to you any alteration in your medication. And that system, that system works ent entirely on your smartphone. Cancer treatment is almost all outpatient. So you've had you chemotherapy. Uh, the patient engagement system will allow you to not uh, notify your doc after, after chemo this afternoon, you had a, have a, a, a moderately high fever the doctor then can respond uh, respond to that with the appropriate therapeutics. Uh, it allows you to, uh, it allows anybody uh, that with a patient engagement system to participate in clinical trials. You don't have to be in Boston or, or New York or LA to be in a clinical trial. You can be uh, at a rural hospital and sharing this information with your docs and the people who are running the clinical trial. So it, it gives us a much more diverse population in clinical trials. Uh, and, and, the, and the patient engagement system is not only uh, used for clinical treatments, also used for wellness management. Uh, it's how you make appointments with your doctors. It's how you schedule uh, telemedicine consultations or in-person consultation, consultations. The core of the Cerner clinical system is called Millennium. Oracle and Cerner are going to modernize and expand Millennium substantially. Uh, first thing we're going to do is make it much easier to use. We're going to add a voice user interface uh, to Millennium that makes it easier for doctors to access data and enter orders. There's an integrated uh, telemedicine module that allows you to consult. If you're, again, living in rural America and you want to consult with a specialist, you can you do that via, via uh, secure video teleconference. Uh, we, we, are, we are adding disease-specific AI, AI, AI modules. This is very interesting. But our platform, Cerner Millennium, is an open system, and it allows medical professionals to add these AI modules uh, to, to help other docs uh, uh, treat cancer. We're integrating clinical trials with uh, Millennium to speed them up. And we're putting all the diagnostic devices on a single Internet of Things network, and we're keeping all the diagnostic uh, dev device results, all the images and all the other data in a, in a database that we use for machine learning. Again, we guarantee data privacy. All of that data is anonymized. The only one who can look at that data in its identified form is you, the only one who can give that, that permission. The clinical systems can be very tricky to use. With the voice user interface, you want to find Larry Ellison's most recent x-rays. You say, please give me Larry Ellison's most recent x-rays. If you want to alter uh, my dosage of a particular medication, you just, again, speak to the system. It makes the system much easier to learn and use. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it frees up a lot of doctor's time to meet with patients rather than to enter data. We have an integrated telemedicine system. Uh, it's built on secure video. These are massive changes to how the system currently works. Um, by integrating clinical trials with every hospital that, that, that has the, you know, the, the, uh, the, our new clinical system, 
means that any hospital in the US or any hospital using the system can participate in the clinical trial. Uh, that, so that means the clinical trials, which today are clustered in, in, around major research hospitals, uh, you, you suddenly can start recruiting patients for uh, the clinical trial from rural hospitals in the United States, from rural hospital, hospitals in Latin America or South Africa or Southeast Asia. So you get a much more diverse population uh, uh, to, um, uh, to, to participate in the clinical trials, which gives you much better information. So that diversity is extremely important on clinical trials. And, and we speed up, we speed up uh, the clinical trial uh, by uh, automating uh, all, all, of this, all of the submissions uh, uh, to, uh, to the regulators. Uh, managing, um, ordering drugs, ordering medical supplies, managing the inventory uh, inside of a hospital is very complicated because the inventory is distributed throughout the, throughout the hospital. Uh, and uh, we're making major improvements with all of that. Uh, a hospital is a very complicated workforce, much more complicated than say a company like Oracle or bank like JP Morgan Chase. Docs uh, often are not employees of Stanford Hospital or employees of UCLA or Cedar sinai They're all often contract workers. And uh, they work a couple of days at UCLA. They work a couple of days someplace else. They have their own practice. So just scheduling the docs, recruiting the docs, paying the docs is, a, is much more, is one of the most complicated workforces in the world. Uh, you know, that's another thing we're, we, uh, we're dramatically improving is our HR system for hospitals to deal with this very complex workforce. And of course, uh, hospitals have to do a lot of regulatory reporting, financial accounting, uh, and we, we're auto automating all of that. It's interesting to note that Oracle is already, uh, you know, Oracle Fusion in the cloud, ERP and HR applications are, all, are already dominant amongst healthcare providers, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Cedars, but it's a long list. We, uh, we, we are now the dominant provider of ERP and HR uh, for healthcare providers. Huge amount of time is consumed in negotiating that between the provider and the payer. Uh, we're automating all of that and letting, letting the docs not spend less of their time negotiating for reimbursement and more of their time treating patients managing this contract workforce and recruiting, scheduling, paying them according to their contracts, giving them the benefits according to their contract, enormously complicated. And we're enhancing our HR systems to do that for, for, for hospitals and, cl and clinics uh, around the United States and around the world. Uh, the compliance, uh, to automatically do all the compliance reporting to regulators and of course, uh, a complete set of, of uh, financial accounting uh, allows the hospital to budget, you know, to budget and plan. Uh, again, this is something we already do extremely well at Oracle, is uh, human resources, we're a leader in human resources management, we're a leader in uh, supply chain and inventory. So we're just gonna do better what we, are, what we already do. This new health management system will deliver much better information uh, uh, to healthcare professionals. It will deliver better patient outcomes, help docs deliver better patient outcomes, help public health officials improve uh, health, uh, public health policy and lower overall costs. That is now our primary mission here at Oracle. Thank you. Well, thank you, Larry. That was a pretty amazing overview of the future of healthcare. Larry just described the promising future of a new way of thinking about health management. And we're gonna dig in further to each area of this new system. But first, we wanna highlight that the benefit of Oracle's health management system can't truly be realized without partners. Partners that connect our open ecosystem, partners that work with us to promote the vision and benefits. The Tony Blair Institute for Global Change started working with Oracle during the pandemic. Our shared vision to improve public health outcomes globally has catalyzed this partnership to continue to grow. 
I am so pleased to introduce Sir Tony Blair, the former Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Hello, everyone. My institute, which is a not-for-profit, works with governments all over the world, especially in some of the poorest parts, and we're very proud of our partnership with Oracle. The aim of the Institute is very simple, to help leaders to govern better by providing the solutions which will allow them to build societies which are prosperous, inclusive, and secure. And one of government's biggest priorities is, of course, healthcare. COVID-19 showed us the big gains to be made by deploying technology effectively, not only in fighting the pandemic, but in creating the healthcare systems of the future without the necessity of replicating the often outdated legacy systems of the developed world. Governments everywhere are recognizing that healthcare can be transformed by data and life science innovation. And this is where Oracle comes in. Oracle has decades of experience in healthcare, has successfully delivered solutions in the global fight against the pandemic, and now is building a remarkable capability to create a more personal health experience powered by unified global data. So there is a natural convergence between Oracle and the Institute on the role of technology and data systems as the basis of transformative change in healthcare. More importantly, we see the possibility of improved outcomes for citizens from better, high quality care to an improved quality of life. Our shared ambition starts with the vision to implement a unified health management system based on a new national data platform. This will allow all the health information of a country, presently fragmented, to be stored in one place where it can be analyzed and utilized for the purpose of improving health outcomes. In addition, the system can enable the individual to have access to their health data on their smartphone. And this will empower citizens and provide clinicians and other care providers with immediate access to their health history and treatment without chasing it down from disparate sources. Together, therefore, Oracle and the Institute for Global Change are already working with several governments to help them on this journey. In Senegal, for example, our partnership saw Oracle's web-based vaccine management solution rapidly implemented across all 14 regions of the country at the height of the pandemic. And this solution then played a critical role in ensuring the most vulnerable people were prioritized for vaccination at a time when supply was still very scarce. Transformation of this nature can't be tackled by our two organizations alone, however. Partnerships across the health ecosystem are necessary to achieve that shared vision and accelerate access. Several partnerships already exist. One of the most exciting is the Global Pathogen Analysis System, GPAS, which is now being used by organizations on nearly every continent and which plays a significant role sequencing and detecting COVID variants early on. We're only just beginning to explore the true potential of this solution and what outcomes it can enable in developing countries. We also understand the value of partnering with other technology firms and are committed to building an open platform so that together we can provide the best possible technology to tackle this global challenge. And I've been immensely excited by the willingness to solve problems together for the greater good of humanity. And I appreciate Oracle's leadership position in this space. And this is just the beginning. World leaders today are looking beyond the pandemic. Our shared vision to advance global health is distinct from anything hitherto we've been able to attempt. With the addition of an electronic health record solution, another part of Oracle's portfolio, I think there's real potential to deliver on that vision in the near term. So all of this is hugely exciting 
But above all, it has the capacity to transform lives for the better. Thank you. What a compelling vision for the future of healthcare and what a fantastic partnership. It is a future with greater health equity, predictability, improved outcomes for people globally. As I promised at the start of this event, there's more to learn about Oracle's long-term industry footprint. With more than 11,000 healthcare customers globally, Oracle has played a role in key industry achievements. So let's look at where we already are today. Our next speaker, Mike Cecilia, Executive Vice President for Oracle Industries, will share more about our extensive industry portfolio and some of the lessons we learned at the height of the pandemic, which are now informing our future Oracle Health portfolio. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Stephanie. Thanks everyone for, for attending and being here today. So as Stephanie mentioned, I'd like to focus on some of the things that we've already been doing in the healthcare space prior to acquiring Cerner. Now, of course, we're very excited to stitch those things together with Cerner and create an even better system. But for nearly 15 years, Oracle has been a leading provider of clinical cloud solutions. Those clinical cloud solutions, primarily aimed at the pharmaceutical and biotech startup or biotechnology in general space, break down into two major categories. The first is clinical research, and that is everything from when a molecule is first discovered that could become a therapeutic or a vaccine or something in the future, collecting patient information during clinical trials, uh, data collection, study startup, the overall portfolio planning, and everything that's required to take that molecule and eventually turn it into a therapeutic that is, de that is delivered or drug that's delivered to patients. The other piece of it that's very interesting is the pharmacovigilance business or drug safety business. So this is the process that goes on well beyond uh, when a clinical trial uh, ends. And when a drug is, uh, comes to market, there needs to be ongoing safety, ongoing safety monitoring for these type of uh, situations for many, many years, 10 years minimum, some go on uh, much longer. To give you an idea of some of the size and the scale of our pharmacovigilance database today. Last year in the United States, in 2021, 91% of all vaccine adverse events were reported to the FDA from our Oracle pharmacovigilance database. So 91% of all safety signals were in the Oracle pharmacovigilance database. To put it in perspective, that's the largest single safety database in the world. Now, last year was quite busy with lots of new vaccines coming to market for COVID-19, but this has been something that we've been very proud to partner with our pharmaceutical customers and regulators throughout the world. 406 unique authorities were beneficiaries, including the United States FDA, across the world. Last year, we processed over 10 million adverse events. Again, it was an unusually busy year given the, uh, the advent and scale up of COVID vaccines throughout the world but that's what we do. We're here for scale. Our systems are built to scale for very large data sets and the 10 million uh, events were handled with relative ease. Three million of those events came from one customer alone, a vaccine client. To date, we've managed over 250,000 studies and over 30,000 individual clinical trials. So chances are, if you're taking a medication today, somehow the Oracle technology has touched something along the process of getting that medication safely into you and providing you benefit. We're happy to count 28 of the world's tw top 30 pharmaceuticals as customers for our, for our clinical systems. Now, what we're really excited about is the future. Clinical trials are changing. They have to change. They have to be more diversified. They have to be more inclusive. As Larry said, today, it's not uncommon for clinical trials to be heavily concentrated at very large university-led systems. Um, that worked okay for many, many years. COVID completely flipped the script, if you will. In a pandemic where everybody was impacted, you have to be sure that as you think about bringing vaccines to market in this example, that they're going to work for everybody. Uh, we wanna be careful that we don't have a vaccine that's developed that doesn't work for a certain demographic and that demographic was not represented in the trial. Even worse, 
We want to be careful that we don't bring something to market that causes harm to certain demographics or certain people that weren't represented in a trial. That has happened before. There are well-documented cases of certain therapeutics and certain pharmaceuticals in general that had underrepresentation in clinical trials and not good things happen. That's why we're so excited about Clinical One. Clinical One, our brand new unified platform for clinical trials, is built to handle decentralized trials as well as, as, well as uh, traditional highly centralized trials as well. We can spin up new trials in days. It's simple to use. It's easy to do, and in fact, providers can do it themselves using metadata-driven configuration or composable application technology. This means that third parties, system integrators, Oracle developers don't have to get involved in all the nuances that differentiate clinical trials. Customers can do that themselves. That, we think, is a huge new, uh, new offering for clinical trials, and it's the only platform of its, of its nature today that works in this case. It works in this manner. In fact, today, that Clinical One system, even though it's relatively new, is already in use at 33 countries throughout the world. Now, what's the next step for Clinical One? Direct integration with Cerner EHR, Cerner Millennium, makes tremendous sense. We want to avoid duplication of entry. We want to make sure that providers only have to use one system when they're dispersing a medication and not have to double entry these things into two systems, as well as allow community hospitals and community points of care to participate in clinical trials at the same rate that large university-led systems are doing today. So during the process of um, the COVID Operation Warp Speed uh, clinical trials, then called Operation Warp Speed, uh, we developed a partnership with the NIH and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle. This was an amazing um, outcome from what started as a very simple discussion. Dr. Jim Kublin, who was uh, running many of the trials in charge of uh, the protocol for many of the clinical trials, uh, called us, and I'll never forget this conversation. He said, we, we've got to get a lot of people into trials really quickly. We need to make sure that we have a very diverse population and as much of the electronic pre-screening as we can do up front, um, we, we need to do because we need to process people across 88 physical sites for these Operation Warp Speed clinical trials. And we need it to be really simple to use because the general public has to be able to get into this and easily supply their information. We built a system very quickly that processed over 657,000 volunteers for clinical trials. In fact, that allowed the trials to not only meet, but to exceed their diversity and inclusion goals. In many cases, the diversity and inclusion goals for certain, for certain populations were actually exceeded. And that's really, if you, if you know um, a bit about clinical trials, that's a very difficult thing to do, is to make sure that you have enough diversity in the trial. It's one of the single biggest things that slows trials down. We're able to meet and exceed that because we built a system that was so easy to use that the participation rates were so high. In fact, in under 10 minutes, patients were able to provide their full medical history, or at least enough of it, to know whether or not they would be qualified, or in some cases disqualified, for participating in this clinical trial. This is what we need more of. Healthcare systems that are simple to use, consumer friendly, yet very high value. I think there's this, this notion that um, because healthcare is very complex, that the systems have to be equally complex. I actually think the opposite is true. I think easier to use systems will increase participation rates and will have better outcomes as a result. Now we've taken that same technology that we partnered with Dr. Kublin with at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and now applied it for a brand new clinical trial spinning up for HIV vaccines. So there's a site launched in May of 2022 called helpendhiv.org in continued partnership and it allows people in the same way that they volunteered for clinical trials for COVID vaccines to volunteer for a vaccine trial for, for H to help end HIV. There have been similar trials. There have been similar trials uh, in the past for, for HIV vaccines. And in the first few weeks of running this, if you normalize the numbers, we will quadruple the amount of people that have ever volunteered for a clinical trial for an HIV vaccine just in the first few months. It's an amazing statistic. And when you put these consumer-friendly, patient-facing systems out there, people will actually use them. And that's a great thing. So let's hear a few words from Dr. Kublin. We have the ambitious mission of developing a 
preventive HIV vaccine for the world and applying that vaccine to essentially end that pandemic. And many of the lessons um, that we learned over the past decades with the HIV vaccine development was actually applied to that for COVID-19. And now we're seeing that that progress that has been made over the past two years with COVID-19 and the vaccines against COVID can now be applied back to HIV and other pathogens. The partnership we have with Oracle has really made this happen. Thanks, Dr. Kublin. It sure has been a terrific partnership. Okay, uh, moving along. Uh, in addition to working with um, vaccines and, and clinical systems and pharmaceuticals, we've also done quite a bit of work with governments throughout the world. As you heard uh, Sir Tony Blair refer to uh, our partnerships in many parts of the world, we've created on-the-fly systems, composable application systems that were able to roll out vaccine management, appointment tracking, efficacy testing systems to governments where we simply replaced paper. In Ghana, for example, uh, we rolled out this system, and since they didn't have COVID vaccine available at the time, they actually used it for yellow fever. We were able to track more vaccinations in the first two days electronically than had ever been tracked electronically in the history of the country prior to those two days. Replacing paper. Some of the stories that you hear are quite heartbreaking in that there were vaccine records that are lost because of floods or fires because they're simply, they're simply written down on pieces of paper. Obviously, there's still a lot of paper in many healthcare systems throughout the world. The fact that we can digitize these systems and we can roll them out throughout the world, and I'm happy to say they're alive in Senegal, Ghana, Rwanda, Tasmania, and others, not just for COVID-19, but for routine vaccinations and disease management as well. We recently, we partnered with the Oxford University to create the Global Pathogen Analysis System. You heard both Larry and Sir Tony refer to this. Let me add a, a, couple, new, uh, a couple new pieces of information here. The system created at Oxford was first, was first scaled up to deal with uh, tuberculosis and looking for, looking for variants of interest in tuberculosis. We were able to very quickly scale and migrate that to the Oracle Cloud and refactor it using a brand new, I with the, uh, brand new UI with the Oracle Apex development environment. Within a matter of weeks, we had the system completely ported to the Oracle Cloud. The scalability, the scalability went up by factors of numbers that are so big that you wouldn't even believe them that if, if, if I told you. So that's, let's say that we're in the orders of hundreds of thousands of records difference per day in order to being able to track. This system is now in use on an almost every continent, six of the seven continents in the world today. There are 40 governments throughout the world who are in line taking training to come in to start to use this system, not just for COVID tracking, but we will expand it to other pathogens of interest. Now, genomic sequencing, pathogen sequencing has been around for quite a bit, but what I'm most excited about is working with some of our partners. One of them is Oxford Nanopore, and they've done a tremendous job at it, you're taking, uh, taking the, the, the often difficult task of collecting a pathogen sample uh, to the field. And they have devices that can fit in the palm of your hand that we can take out into the field. They're directly connected to the Oracle Cloud. And within minutes, we have the results of that pathogen sequence. And we can help public health officials determine whether or not a particular variant is what's called a variant of interest meaning it would have some kind of a uh, you know, natural immunity because you were previously in infected or your vaccines would be ineffective against those vaccines. These are game-changing platforms that we think should be part of every government and every public policy, every public health administration's toolbox, if you will, for dealing not just with pandemics, but dealing with foodborne, foodborne illnesses and anything that can affect and impact the general public. Larry also mentioned vSafe, which is the post-vaccination um, safety surveillance uh, system, safety monitoring system um, to deal with uh, folks who volunteer. Everybody here volunteered to supply their information after they received a COVID vaccine. This for me was the tipping point of convincing myself, and I think a lot of my colleagues would agree, that we could do something dramatic to change healthcare. Uh, I'll never forget, again, another phone call we had with the CDC. Um, there was, it was widely known that there would be lots of trepidation about COVID vaccines. There would be lots of angst and, and worry about, uh, boy, these things came to market really quickly. Are they really safe? Are we going to have issues? And they said, can we develop a real world tracking system so that we can get direct feedback from patients, direct feedback from citizens, not disintermediated, 
by providers or having to go through older systems like the VAERS database, we need direct feedback. We we're able to build that system in 68 days from kickoff to go live. It has now scale, scaled to become the most comprehensive patient safety monitoring in the history of safety patient monitoring. Over 150,000 patient, 50 million, sorry, let me say that again. 150 million patient reported outcomes are in this database today and it continues to grow. On peak days, when there are major vaccination events, there are over one million concurrent users in the system at any given point. It's a staggering, it's a staggering piece of technology and what's great about it is it's staggeringly simple. So we can see here, um, these are sample screens, but on the left is, uh, if you will, the public health officials view. So that they can see what's going on at any given time with real time monitoring into, into all those who volunteered. And on the right is a sample screen from the vSafe application. These are the types of intuitive applications and the types of intuitive decision making tools that we need to put in the hands and we will put in the hands and we are putting in the hands of both providers and patients. Now, something very stunning happened today with vSafe. We put out a survey. Uh, a randomized survey to uh, anyone who had used vSafe uh, for, um, a, certainly a randomized population survey for, for all the population of people who had reported their symptoms using vSafe. Over 133,000 people replied to that survey. So I'm gonna give you some, some statistics, and I wanna be clear that I'm not talking about the law of small numbers here. 133,000 people replied. 96% of the people said the system was either highly intuitive or, or crazy highly intuitive to use. That crazy highly intuitive was at 90%. 90% of these people said this was the easiest system to use. I couldn't have imagined it would have been so easy. An additional 3%, so 99 total, said that they were completely satisfied with the usability of the system. When you round and you look at percentages, 0% of folks said it was either difficult to use or so difficult to use that they couldn't use it. In fact, 53 people out of 133,000 people said that the system was difficult. Less than one half of 1% of the people said it was too difficult to use. Now, if you've ever done consumer application surveys before, and you've ever asked people for their feedback, you generally don't always get great feedback. Look at some of the, uh, the survey sites and, the, and the, these things that are out there. When you ask 133,000 people for their feedback, you would think a lot more than 53 people would have a problem with it. Turns out they do. This is, I think, is a major confidence booster for all of us. We can create simple, highly to use immersive systems, all built in a single database, giving providers all the tools they need, giving pub public health officials all the tools they need to create better outcomes and govern better public health. Okay, final section of things that we've been doing already at Oracle is on the payer side, on the healthcare, on the healthcare payer side. So this is what I like to call a lot and a lot problem. There's a lot of money spent on healthcare and there's a lot of money wasted on healthcare. $3.6 trillion, $265 billion. This is according to the Journal of the American Medical Association is wasted due to administrative complexity. Yesterday, or two days ago rather, I got a check in the mail from my health insurance provider. It was for $12.50. It turns out that somewhere along the line, I still don't know where, when, or how, I overpaid a provider by $12.50, and I got a paper check in the mail. The immediate thought that I had was, well, that's pretty good, and the second thought I had was, how much did it cost them to figure out that I owed $12.50? Probably a heck of a lot more than $12.50, and so the insurance company then had to cut me a check for that, the provider then had to reconcile their books to, to reduce their revenue by $12.50. What a system that we're dealing with here, uh, something has to be done. Well, today, we're offering solutions for health insurance providers with over 100,000 administered members, 200 million, I'm sorry, 100 million administered members, 200 million global claims processed, generating $300 billion in annual premium revenue. So again, very large complex data sets, very large swag of the population here in the United States, we can do better. This industry is ripe for automation and we need to figure out ways that at the time of care, patients can understand what their obligations are, what their financial obligations are. Not six months after the fact. Now usually the check, usually you don't get a check, you get a bill. That was the first time I did get it. I did get a check, I usually do get bills, but, uh, but I was happy that this time was a check. 
we need to make sure that all of that is transparent at the time the care is delivered, and we can do it with better automation. We also need to help patients understand whether or not they're going to qualify for a particular procedure or a certain pharmaceutical. It can take days, weeks, months to figure out whether or not you're going to get approved. That's true in single-payer systems as well. That's not just a phenomenon in multi-payer systems like we have in the United States. All of this is ripe for automation. We can do it. We can do it with an open ecosystem that we provide. We can also do it all the way at the same time that we're transitioning to value-based payments and helping providers understand the value of care given and how that turns, and how that turns into reimbursable revenue, not just in a fee-for-service model. Now, that may seem um, pretty bold. That may seem like a pretty bold endeavor, but we don't like to take on small things at Oracle. In fact, for 45 years, uh, we've been at the forefront of managing the most complex databases in the world. Larry spoke about credit card databases and all of those things. I'm very positive and very confident that we can do the same thing here. We can create a system that's easier to use, and we can return all of that wasted money, or at least a very big percent of that wasted money, back into providing better care for patients. That would be a phenomenal thing. Some of our clients, uh, as you see uh, along the bottom, are some of the largest uh, providers, some of the lar largest payers in the system today. Uh, we're thrilled. We're thrilled with the benefits that they've gotten today, even without the advanced automation that we'll build together with the Cerner applications. There's tremendous value, and we look forward to continuing to partner with these clients and customers to further, further uh, reduce the time it takes to process claims and further consolidate into single bill billing systems and have that available very timely and very accurately. So there you have an overview. Some of the areas that Oracle's been up to in the space, and you may not have been aware of any of these areas. Of course, we're incredibly excited to integrate all of this with the Cerner applications, and we think create an even more highly automated, highly efficient system that benefits both providers and patients. And we're going to do all of that at global scale. We're going to do all of that to scale to nations and to, the, and to the globe. That's what we need. We need more, we need a lot more consolidation of data. We need a lot better information around it. We have the tools, the technologies to do it. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Tony Ambrosi, who's the Senior Vice President and Chief Digital Officer and C Chief Information Officer at Baptist Health. Tony's going to share his thoughts about the evolution of EHR and the systems that we need to help providers to deliver better care. EHR is about an electronic health record. Are more central and more core to the systems, the provider systems, than any other piece of software. So I think you know, very important uh, for healthcare, and I think very important for uh, for providers and the system supporting those providers is first and foremost, I would say, we need to figure out the uh, usability uh, problem that providers, doctors, uh, nurses have with all EHRs in principle, and everything that happens needs to be recorded. But in this day and age, in the 21st century, we need capabilities uh, in that space that are a lot more um, um, proactive, if you want, in, in assisting providers with the care, rather than just a place to record. I think that's, that's, that's a one thing that's is becoming uh, obvious to, to a lot of folks around uh, those systems. It has to do with data. It's hard to be uh, consumed if it's not curated properly. But at the same time, we actually don't have enough data um, because we need to do look at the um, genomics or the uh, lifestyle or um, um, determinants to bring that into um, into the care um, and the only way to do that effectively is for using data and the machine learning associated with that to learn faster and learn more and and being able to inject the recommendations into the systems at the point of providing the care So we covered reducing clinical trials potentially to weeks and days, to expanding our payer and provider interlocks in a value-based world. And having personally spoken with Tony Ambrosi many times, I can say we are definitely fully aligned that we need to create more human-centric experiences for patients and the care team. Tony talked about the importance of data and how it is siloed, disconnected, and missing several layers that would enable greater insights. 
I am sure that everyone listening can relate. Why can I get intelligent recommendations on the next sweater that I should buy based on my personal buying habits, but I can't get recommendations on ways to manage or improve my health? With Oracle's acquisition of Cerner, we will connect those dots and create an improved consumer grade experience with enterprise grade security that helps the care team and patient be more proactive throughout their health journey. Next, let's hear from two of my brand new colleagues joining us from Cerner. David Feinberg shares why he's excited about joining Oracle and Brenna Quinn will discuss what this all really means for patients and providers. To use data to make sure that people have the right information they need for patients is something that I dealt with as a physician. As a hospital executive, I'm worried about population management and taking care of communities. That data is absolutely crucial. We have the opportunity to change healthcare like it's never been done before. I can picture times where the information you're looking for as a clinician is not only there, we're giving you more information that allows you to make better decisions, makes your workflow easier. And for patients, the end of um, worrying about does the right hand know what the left hand knows? Because all of the information about you is put together and shared with you and your caregiver so you can make a plan so that you, your family and community can achieve optimal health. Of course, I want it to be secure and private, but I also want it to flow to my caregivers so they know and we have this back and forth about what I need to do to achieve my health goals. We're bringing world-class technology coupled with a deep and long history of understanding how healthcare works. I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here today as we begin our journey as Oracle Cerner. We're coming together with our combined strengths to really leverage and make changes in how health can happen. Together, we can connect the provider and the patient to that broad ecosystem that we spoke about. And everything that Larry articulated of the future begins with the foundation of the electronic health record. And as you heard, the EHRs have been around for decades. Um, we've been evolving them to improve, and Cerner has been leading that innovation for years. And in most parts of the world, we've completely eliminated the paper record, and we've digitized most of the complex clinical workflows. But as you've heard, digitizing the record is just the beginning. And we, f we firmly believe that the full value of the EHR comes when we can transform it from that system for documenting and billing to a tool that reduces the complexity of healthcare and becomes the single source of information, the complete source of information for a person's healthcare. It should change how care is provided. Leveraging data and advanced technologies like AI and prioritizing human-centric experiences, we can make healthcare more proactive, more accessible, and more equitable. When we think about healthcare, at the end of the day, it all begins with us as individuals. As consumers, we're all going to have to interact with that healthcare system. And it when we do, it should be easy and convenient, and it should give us choice and control. As Stephanie said, you want it to be as simple as finding a sweater and doing online shopping. At Oracle Cerner, we've been advancing those core EHR capabilities to engage the consumer, to give them the ability to manage how and access they care, how they access care, and provide them the touch points throughout their care. So if you think about it, I today could get notification during Breast Cancer Month that it's time for a mammogram. With a click, I can schedule my appointment, I can pick the place and time I want to get care, and prior to arriving, I'm gonna get a text reminder telling me when my time is, just like I get for my hair appointment, but it's also gonna give me information about what to be prepared for at check-in. After I have my mammogram, I'm gonna to continue to get notifications telling me it's time to see your results, and by the way, you can go look at your bill, and you can pay that bill. Might not be right, but you can go pay it. Uh, <laughs> It's that kind of experience that we've all come to expect, 
And as we come together, as you, know, you heard from Mike, we're gonna be able to advance that experience and drive more usability to the consumer and increase content and access to information. Equally important to the consumer experience is that experience we all have the day we're sitting in an exam room with a nurse or a physician. That's the day we become patients. And as patients, what we want is we want a personal experience. We want to feel like the people that are taking care of us know us. We don't wanna to have to answer the same question over and over and over again. We wanna feel like the physician that's taking care of us has information about me. They should know things like, I'm vaccinated, I have a history of high blood pressure, oh, and I just had an MRI for neck pain. I shouldn't have to tell him that. I should feel comfortable enough with him and he should be in a position to have a meaningful, informative conversation with me. Likewise, that caregiver, those physicians and nurses, they do not wanna be tethered to their computer. That is not what they went into practice for. They wanna be able to provide high quality care to the patients they serve. The EHR should be that tool. It should have all the information needed to provide the best care, giving insights on information and proactively and intuitively provide information. At the end of the day, the EHR should assist, not burden the physicians. It should equip, equip them to have that information and those insights to give back time with context to have that meaningful conversation that we all wanna have when we're experiencing healthcare. At Oracle Cerner, we're committed to delivering those experiences, and that includes giving the clinicians a comprehensive and complete view of the patient's health history. Larry gave some examples of getting care in different parts of the world. When I think about it personally, I think about my father who spent his winters in Florida, but his cardiologist and primary care doctor were in Pennsylvania. If anything was going to happen to him in Florida, I wanted to know that those doctors would have access to his records. Patients should not have to carry their records around. They should not have to have CDs as they show up at their doctors. The doctors should have that information easily and accessible. And the way we do that is by exchanging that information. And at Cerner, Oracle Cerner, we have long championed the concept and capabilities of interoperability. In fact, we've established a leading health alliance um, that connects today over 160 million lives. That's patient data being exchanged globally. In fact, as an example, the NHS today, we connect 9 million people in East London to share that data for a unified record. But if we really wanna make a difference, it's not just about the individual patient. It is really about using data to understand and manage conditions across populations and communities. We can do this with the ability to take the large data sets that we have, stratify them, understand the patterns and trends across a community, and really drive meaningful, equitable care. An example of this would be, I think most people understand there's a correlation between uh, diabetes and blindness. And in fact, diabetic retinopathy can limit your, your, vis your vision, but it actually can cause total blindness. In 90% of the cases, it can be treated and prevented if you have an annual eye exam. With the use of Cerner's data products, One Health System today is managing an important gap in care across their population, diabetic patients who are missing their annual eye exam. What we've been able to do by accessing the large data sets and registries of clinical information is identify those patients who have not shown up for an annual exam and then send off a trigger to a care manager. That care manager can then reach out to that patient and query what's, what's the obstacle to coming in for an eye exam? Is it location? Do you actually need a ride? Do I need to get a caseworker involved? And pull in that, that patient to get that exam. In this case, they've been able to drive up their percentages of compliance, and which is ultimately improving wellness across their whole diabetic population. This is just an example of the types of things you can do with large data to control diseases across populations. 
thinking about our opportunity moving forward in this picture, where we can really connect our collective work to drive human-centric care. Together, as Oracle Cerner, we bring all the pieces together and we can accelerate that transformation of that EHR tool that's burdening to really being the enabler that's open, intuitive, agnostic platform that connects patients, providers, payers, and populations in a meaningful way. As Oracle Cerner, we are uniquely positioned to do this because we've got the power of Oracle, we've got technology, we've got the cloud, and we've got a proven portfolio of healthcare capabilities that we can pull together and extend our proven foundation of provider applications. This is something no other healthcare vendor, no other EHR vendor on the planet can do. We're going to see the ability to advance technology like artificial intelligence, we've talked about that, voice enablement, so that a physician can actually have a patient conversation and that complex clinical information is captured automatically. And so clinical notes are being written without the, the physician having to engage with the computer. We'll be able to extend that access, as Mike talked about, to the payers. When we do that, not only will we eliminate the friction between patients and providers, but we'll be able to give better transpa transparency of the cost of care to the provider as well as to the patient. And the ability to impact margins for providers is phenomenal. That big problem, big numbers, drive those numbers down. Additionally, we'll connect the patient data that creates the ability to take what today is episodic records. It's all based on where you had your last moment of care. But take all those points of care, regardless of where it was, and connect them to truly cre create that lifetime clinical record that's accessible to care teams and to patients. As Oracle Cerner, we're already working together to quickly introduce a new simplified user experience for clinicians and for consumers. We'll bring together more meaningful insights in a crisp, easy to navigate manner. Together as Oracle Cerner, we are so excited to leverage our technology, innovation, and expertise to address the challenges of today. We're going to work together to deliver a unified system that's based on longitudinal data and is broadly accessible and oriented to the individual. It's this work that I think I'm speaking for all of the associates across the Cerner, Oracle Cerner population, that makes us so excited to join this great vision because we believe we truly can change how healthcare is delivered. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Stephanie. So thank you, David and Brenna. There are some pretty exciting things ahead for us together. But don't be mistaken, enhanced experience means more than simply a new look. We will iteratively improve workflows, layer our AI and machine learning capabilities to improve health for individuals and entire populations. Our third objective to reduce cost is critical to helping improve health equity. As the cost of care comes down and expands beyond the four walls of a hospital or health clinic, access to care can increase. Our next guest, Dr. Jim Hildreth, President and Chief Executive Officer of Meharry Medical College, is an advocate for improved health equity. He recognizes the importance of data in that mission. After we hear from Dr. Hildreth, we will be joined by Steve Miranda, Executive Vice President of Application Development at Oracle. Steve will discuss our supply chain and human capital management solutions and the value of a real end-to-end -end story, including full administrative systems. First of all, when I was in medical school in the early 80s, physicians were the center of everything. They were the center of the healthcare universe. Now we understand the patient has to be the center of the universe and a team of people take care of them. So that's a profound change. The other one is technology um, and the use of technology to both diagnose and treat diseases has caused us or allowed us to treat some diseases that before were not touchable, right? Technology did that for us. The thing that's more burdensome is 
the payers are now requiring that certain things be documented quite precisely. And so there's a lot of time spent making sure the proper codes can be written down and people can be compensated for their work. What we really want is for physicians to do what they were trained to do, which is to take care of patients. And in healthcare and in public health, we now understand quite clearly that data and big data can allow us to develop treatment plans that are more precise and effective and impactful to the people that we care about. I felt very strongly that for Mary Medical College to play its role in making sure health equity is something we can achieve, we had to have strength in data science. So I'm really excited about it. And of course, I'm really excited that Oracle decided to support us in that great work. Thanks. So I'm gonna go through the final leg of the stool, if you will, the provider administration system. And before I get into what that is specifically, let me just set the foundation. Today already, Oracle and our cloud applications provide a complete suite of applications to some of the most complicated industries anywhere in the world, starting with finance, supply chain and manufacturing, human resources, and our customer experience applications. And in fact, we have dozens of successful cloud customers in healthcare today, from providers to payers to healthcare who are in academic uh, centers, like the Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, Mayo Clinic, who are already using our finance and supply chain automation uh, applications today in the cloud to, to automate their processes. With the provider administration system, we're really going to extend and expand that inclusive of Cerner and the health provider systems to shore up some of the issues that we see today. And that provider administration system will be, again, end-to-end -end complete process automation from reimbursement, pre-authorization and billing onto an e-commerce catalog system to have an easy to understand supply chain system, supply chain planning, on through to managing the workforce from complex workforce requirements to contractors, doctors, nurses, everything from scheduling on through to payroll. And then finally, for the financial accounting and the regulatory requirements that all of our customers, hospitals, payers, providers all have. So how are we gonna do it and why are we gonna do it and what is the goal? And the goal is really quite simple. We want to help improve outcomes. And we want to help improve outcomes by allowing physicians and nurses and healthcare professionals focus on the patient and not on administrative systems. They shouldn't be worried about how you order supplies. They shouldn't be worried about the inventory supplies. They shouldn't be worried about their scheduling. You as the patient shouldn't be worried about having the right person at the right time for your appointment or having the right equipment for the procedure or the right drugs for what you need for service. So really tying that all in, taking care of the administration behind the scenes so that those healthcare professionals and experts can focus on you, the patient, not administrative data entry. And we're gonna jump in today just to give you two examples of what we mean by this. The first is managing the workforce management. And quite simply, the problem is pretty simple today. There's a fundamental disconnect between the systems that track what gets done at a hospital, surgeries, appointments with patients, different, uh, different things that doctors and nurses do, and the HR system. The HR system that tracks absences, people's vacation, people's time and entry. And that disconnect is what Oracle and Cerner together bring to solve this problem. So we'll expand our HCM system to take inputs from Cerner and other hospital systems to better track what's actually going on at the hospital and tie that with the HR record. Attendance records, vacation plans, skill set, training capabilities, and the complex scheduling that goes around it so that you as the patient can be assured that the person's available at the right time when you need it. And for the healthcare provider, we eliminate the burdensome on their side of recording their hours or reconciling their pay. But again, by tying the actual work done 
to the HR administrative systems to better ensure that they're tracked accurately, they're paid accurately, again, so they can focus their time on you, the patient. And we do this by expanding to a healthcare-specific set of rules in our existing, highly scalable HR system by adding scheduling capability, time and attendance capability, leave management, and a set of analytics specific to hospitals, hospital workers, and healthcare. And by doing so, we really close the loop. Now, instead of having separate systems, where you have the plan of what's actually happening in the hospital, and then the administration trying to track and compensate and report on what happened in the hospital, but tie those together as one system. And then when you have that one system, it better allows you to do planning so that you can better allocate those highly specialized, highly skilled individuals in the hospital where they're best utilized. And instead of this problem of fragmented systems, you create a virtuous circle and a complete from the plan to the actuals to the exceptions, again, by eliminating and automating the medical professionals from entering data and doing the administration. The second example is remarkably similar, and it's on the supply chain and the supply chain and the procurement process. Once again, at the root of the problem today, you have the actual systems like Cerner, which track what happens in the hospital, which equipments are necessary for certain procedures, which drugs or pharmaceuticals are necessary for certain procedures, and how much gets used during that treatment of a patient at a hospital. Separate today, you have an inventory management system, which is, again, oftentimes manual, without the benefit of RFID and RFID tracking. So again, today, much time is spent, or wasted, really, on hospital professionals who are trained to take care of patients, but instead looking after and recording what uh, of their equipment was used, where the equipment is stored, when they have to refurbish, and going through the order management process to refill that to assure good service for you, the patient. But while you have doctors and nurses doing that, that's time away that they're not spending with patients. And again, our solution is taking the supply chain applications which we have deployed to hundreds of customers around the world and enhancing those in the areas of procurement, e-commerce, planning, and logistics with capabilities very specific for hospitals and with integrations to Cerner and hospital systems record that are out and available. And by closing the loop, very analogous to the HCM system, again, you turn from a highly manual system, which is wasteful and costly, into a highly automated system, which again, starts to build on itself into a virtuous cycle. Because the better job you do of automating and tracking, the better job you can do of supply chain planning and predicting, and predicting fulfillment, and you do that and you get better and better at lower cost. And to do so, we feel it's also critically important that we provide a best-in-class user interface, but probably most importantly, a user interface that is very familiar to everybody. So that if you're a doctor or a nurse, you should be specially trained in your area of expertise. But when you need to do procurement on your job at the hospital, it should just be like you're buying that sweater that got recommended. And so we've built an e-commerce-like system with a beautiful and intuitive UI, but that's very familiar allowing you to create shopping lists, allowing you to have quick access to those shopping lists, to have a personal catalog, and to have several personal catalogs should you have different roles within the hospital. Just as in your e-commerce site, you probably have shopping lists and saved uh, sort lists for you in e-commerce sites that you're familiar with. Bringing that exact same user interface, but with specialty rules which govern what happens in the medical workplace and in hospitals and providers. And by really combining all of those areas and having the end-to-end -end provider administration system, we can save costs, but most importantly, allow doctors, nurses to focus on patients. With that, I'll hand it back to Mike. Thank you, Steve. Well, thanks everyone for being here. So you heard uh, our vision, you heard a lot of what we're up to, and obviously we're all very excited about the future. Uh, bringing Discerner into our organization and marrying together all the things that we're already doing, we think are gonna have tre great tremendous value for our customers.
for our patients and for providers alike. So with that, uh, that's a wrap on all of our, all of our content. Uh, we're going to uh, have all this available for your review on our websites uh, for as long as you'd like to review it. If there's anything you'd like to listen to again, please feel free to. And certainly, we hope that we will see all of you at many upcoming events that we have throughout the year, the biggest of which is Oracle Cloud World in Las Vegas in October. And registration is just about to open for that, so uh, stay tuned for, for a link to that, and we hope, we hope to see you there. With that, I want to say thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you to our partners, like especially the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Thanks for being here today. Have a great day. Have a healthy day. Oxford University Hospitals is a large teaching hospital and research establishment spread across four hospitals in Oxfordshire. So the last couple of years have been tricky for the trust. We had waiting lists before the pandemic that had grown and our demand during the pandemic hasn't really decreased. So some of the new challenges we're facing is how do we redesign our clinical systems to enable and support the new ways of working, such as remote monitoring, home reporting, or visiting patients much more in a community setting and not in the historical four walls of the hospital. Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust is a large acute teaching hospital in uh, northwest London. We've had a, a mix of um, challenges coming through through the pandemic. Uh, it's also provided a huge opportunity to drive digital transformation at a pace we could have only dreamt of before the pandemic. So our technology partners played uh, a huge role in helping us to, to address these issues. One of the challenges that we had was how we put in place pathways for the management of COVID patients. And in eight days, we designed that pathway and we'd implemented it. And that was material to our ability to fast track patients. The partnership with the university is central to everything that we do. From a research perspective, we work very closely with them to provide translational research data that enables studies to look at new AI and machine learning technologies, but also medicines and clinical pathways. So I'm really optimistic about um, the future of uh, Northwest London as an integrated care system. We're now thinking in ways that, that we haven't previously in terms of the equality of access and the equality of outcomes that we're providing to our patients. AI and machine learning will be transformational over the next 10 years. And at our trust, we'll be looking to use this technology to improve diagnostic performance, such as predicting cancers earlier and undertaking routine results for consultants.